So um, today I'm going to be talking about um, a very, very small um, uh, kind of mini application of um, the main thrust of my work to the drug ohm data that Phil put up on the web. And um, I, I'm using the word structured nano publications because the idea of this is that we're trying to um, pull out a knowledge model of an individual assertion that um, can be used in, in a scientific discourse kind of structure. And the question uh, immediately, the, the, the starting point for this is to ask the question, what constitutes a scientific assertion? Where does a scientific assertion come from? So um, typically in um, PowerPoint slides in which many kittens are being killed by Edward Tufte, um, this kind of slide is being seen a lot. You, you, you'll have some scientific assertion across the top of the um, a laser pointer across the top of your um, your slide, followed by data in the form of a graph, and the the, the graphs ha tend to have a t typically the same kind of structure, where you have independent variables um, describing different conditions of experiments, and then a dependent variable which describes how um, the uh, what assay variables are being used to display the effect that you're looking for, and 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 so um, basically the breakdown is that we have interpretations and observations, and they're kind of separate. Um, this has a mathematical statistical structure. This has a logical or kind of ontological structure. Uh, and, and so the kind of thing that you might see in a paper is an assertion such as this, which is mice like cheese. Well, okay, great, you made an assertion. How do you know that mice like cheese? Well, you would do an experiment where you give the animal lots of different types of food, right, to see your independent variable, and then you'd measure the amount of food that the animal would consume. And that would, and so the, you, you have this semantic representation up here based in ontologies, and you have some kind of mathematical comparison between this data and this data that supports that. Okay, that's the basic premise of the model that I'm going to be talking about. So let's just, just, let's just think of this idea of nanopublications that we've been hearing so much about as um, simply that we're trying to collate and track and process a whole bunch of different assertions such as mice-like cheese. Okay? The trouble is that the semantics of this is very, very complicated. Um, if you look at some titles of papers for the kinds of assertions that people make in real scientific articles, it can get kind of hairy. So um, novel neurotrophic factor CDNF protects midbrain dopaminergic neurons in vivo. This is, a, a, um, this is just a, a Parkinson's study that was published in Nature. Um, hippocampo hypothalamic connections, origin in cervicular cortex, not Ammon's horn. This was a groundbreaking neuroanatomical connectivity paper back in the 1970s. And my favorite, which is work done by a colleague of mine, Arshad Khan, um, and I'm not even going to read this. But it's, it's a, it's a serious, I mean, to the people in the field, this means a lot. They'll, they'll be like, oh, really? Oh, my God, it <laughs> rapidly elevates levels of... So, so it, this, this is the point. The semantics of this stuff is tricky. Now, so we, it's, a, it's a tautological thing to say that assertions vary in their levels of reliability and specificity, of course. Um, and, but the idea is, can we introduce a generalized formalization of these things? based upon the scientific variables, the independent variables and the dependent variables of a study. And that's, that's the kind of heart and soul of what I'm talking about here. And of course, you know, I want to eat my own dog food. That seems to be a favorite expression today. I want to see if I can apply this approach to the drug ohm data set and just see if it works. Okay, so what is it, how does this model work? I call it uh, knowledge engineering from experimental design. And of course, the, the acronym for this is KFED, which is kind of funny because it's Kevin, Be um, Kevin Federline, but you know, just, just to give something people to, something to remember. And, and the, the basis of it is that you try, you're, you're interested in, so these things are the variables. These little square blocks are, are the dependent variables, the measurements that you make in an experiment. And these things are the parameters that you have in the experiment. And so what we did was we, we take an experiment, and this is actually, you remember that horrible phrase from the Arshad Khan's paper? This is the experiment that gave rise to it. Okay, so it's a, it's a fairly, and I can just walk you through it very quickly. Basically, they take a, this is a, um, a study in um, neurophysiology and neuroendocrinology, in fact, where they get an animal, they, um, they, they inject a drug into a specific part of the brain, and then they basically, um, uh, they, they collect, they, they euthanize the animal and then collect blood and, and study um, blood hormones, and then they basically section the brain and do three different types of analysis on it, one immunohistochemistry, one uh, NISL and one in, in situ hybridization, and then compare all the data at the end. And so, the kind of the idea of this is that if we're interested in this data down here, how do we know what the variable dependencies are between that data and the parameters that are setting the data? 
And it actually turns out to be quite simple. You just trace a path back through the protocol and see which of the parameters are being set at which time. Okay, and this gives you the dependency, the variable dependency for free. So that's, that's the, the premise. Actually, and we'll get into a little bit of how that isn't the, t the whole story when you start getting into more complicated data analysis, um, as I'm sure all the people working on workflows are just kind of just thinking of right now. Um, but as a premise and as a starting point for being able to collect data as it's being measured, that's, uh, that's the, the basis of this modeling approach. Um, and so I'm just going to switch over to um, a couple of movies that I have. We actually have built a tool that um, uh, allows you to design and build data models in this way. So if you'll give me a second. So this is a, a, a very much speeded up movie. I, I, I multiplied my, I just used the tool and captured the screen. Yeah, hold on a sec. Okay. Let's just slow this down a little bit. Uh, okay. and so I'll, I'll just let it run from the beginning. And the idea is you just, you have a palette up at the top left hand corner here, which has elements that you, you pull in and drag in here. And you basically just compose your workflow of these elements by using the tool and re-editing these things. Each one of these elements is, uh, um, is represented as a data object on this side as well. So you can actually enter the, um, actually I want to pause there. This is a little too quick for, for, to be able to see it. So the, the whole point is here, the measurement of blood pressure has a little bit of a, a substructure to it. It has two parts, the diastolic and systolic sections. Um, the tool allows you to add those as a, a structured element and then add things like the units and, and, and such like to it. So you, there is a, a little bit of additional substructure um, that's required in addition to the, the, the way in which these things thread together. And, and, and so you can, as you can see, I'm just speeding through entering uh, a, a, a data, a design of a, of a schema, and I can actually pull out, um, as you just saw, I, I, I basically pulled out a, an element and then inserted a new, um, uh, a, a new process in there and then added a parameter that I can then parameterize and, and say, well, I'm, I'm uh, injecting drugs into an animal and the drug has two things, a chemical and a dosage. Um, so that, uh, and I can uh, assign um, nanomoles as the unit. Uh, and, and then finally, I, you know, this took me four minutes to do. I know what I'm doing, but uh, to put together a very simple schema for this, it just took me four minutes to kind of throw this, throw this in there. Um, and and entering data is the same thing. This is a very, very quick movie, and basically, you, you, by you're, you're actually able to select the, um, the, the variable you're entering and then just enter data in a tabular form into the, into the tool. And this is the demo that we're showing um, before. So let me just get back. So thank you for that. Sorry, it was a little bit discordant and all over the place. Um, so then, so this is, that's the basic kind of introduction to Bioscholar and the, the, the tool that we built and the KFED model as a whole. Um, now, what was I going to do with the, 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 the tuberculosis drug ohm that, 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 that we were given to play with? I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll just, um, I'll, I'll work through the methods and model the experimental protocol. And I, I just want to understand what the independent dependent variables are of a, this, of this study, because obviously it's a study, therefore they'll, they'll be independent dependent variables. And then I'll try and go through the text and find the, the assertions, the interpretive assertions that are being made. And of course, that was the plan, and um, it turned out that, that was a little bit simplistic because this is a computational biology study. It is not, you don't start with an animal and then do an experiment on it. You actually start with data, with a complex data structure at the start, and then you do processing on it. So the, the, the basic premise that we have falls short of the actual methodology that we, that, that, that's required for this problem, but 
what's great is that this actually gives me a whole bunch of stuff to do in terms of extending the model to deal with um, computational workflows. And I think that's a, a really interesting point that I want to make at the end. So uh, I'll just flip through this very quickly. The, um, the, basically, the way in which I looked at this was, uh, oh, and the, the workflow analysis and the way in which the data is generated is still valid. Um, it's just that you can't trace the parameters in the same way. So um, I'm sure all of you, uh, so basically, the way in which the, the data was constructed in this model, as far as I could see, was they did, um, you, you, you queried the uh, PubMed, um, sorry, the PDB and ModBase to, to get some uh, protein structures. Um, you also then queried a whole bunch of these databases and, 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 and did a little bit of um, processing to get a whole bunch of drug compounds. Then you um, do this, um, then you look at the compounds and you find out what the, the binding sites are of those compounds. And then you do the SMAP analysis, SMAP analysis, to link the protein structures to the binding sites. And you get this kind of representation. So, um, and, and then, very interestingly, this, is, this wasn't actually described in the paper's method section. It was described in the results. Um, the, you were then able to calculate from this uh, representation of the interaction between a protein and a drug, um, the, this this value called TCDI, um, and I, the the, ca the target chemical druggability index, which in my mind was a kind of punchline of the paper. So this, in a way, is kind of the knowledge representation of the output of the paper. This is the structure of a nano publication that would arise from the drug ohm, uh, and and is a data set that allows you to kind of. Um, make uh, all of those assertions, gives you a model that you can then process, and then you can actually calculate something that's practically useful at the end of it. So in a way, and, and I, I don't want to emphasize this too much, in a way maybe this is kind of like the observations, and these are kind of like the interpretations, but they're both interpretive. So yeah, it's not exactly um, a good distinction, but it, it kind of fits with the, mo the model that I've been using. And, and then I think um, I wanted to draw everybody's attention to this part, part of the paper, which I think is the key part of any scientific study. It's how do you use the, the contents of a single paper to then make predictions that are useful in your field. So um, basically what these guys did, I won't read it, but they, they took, they, they were finding, the whole point is that if you have your drug ohm and you then calculate over it this value, the TCID, the TCDI, um, you can then make predictions about, about whether or not a drug, a molecule, a, I'm sorry, a drug is actually likely to be useful as a, a, in, in treating this, this disease. And, um, and therefore, this statement, you know, it's like there's a whole bunch of, basically, to paraphrase, there's a whole bunch of these drugs that weren't, um, that have a high TCID, TCDI index and aren't um, currently studied. So that, uh, that, in a way, that, that completes the, um, and, and you recognize this um, model that I showed previously, um, that you start off with an experimental design model, and you cycle, and you try and, um, and you have some kind of domain-specific reasoning model, which in this case could be the drug arm itself, uh, that allows you to make predictions, formulate hypotheses, and then design experiments to test them. So, um, and, and just to kind of continue this a little bit, it's not the case that there is a single domain-specific reasoning model within the paper that, that Phil was describing, the drug ohm forms the model that that is working with. But the, the point is, another paper studying a similar, um, exploring that idea and kind of making it a little bit more global and broadening it out a little bit, might actually have a different, slightly different um, modeling approach. But they share an overall kind of thing. So, so in, in discussions with Anita, I have to acknowledge you for this. Um, we've been thinking about how you, know, the low, the, how you have a, a global DSRM that fits in with these kind of cyclic loops of individual studies to construct um, models that you can then process and work with. And of course, it's not as simple as that because you have two, you can have multiple domains which then have to interact and interoperate. And of course, uh, within this, each circle is kind of like a, a fairly, a, isn't really a concrete thing. Um, you have a whole um, uh, menagerie of different elements such as databases and such like as well. So um, these are the conclusions. Thank you very much. I hope I haven't run over time too much. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So a lot to think about. Any questions to Gully? I think we have time for one or two quick ones. Brian. Of course, I have to react on the nano publication term. But uh, first of all, even if you have these horrible nightmare sentences that you showed, which is one of the stupid things we do when we write, um, 
I, what I very much like is the idea that you just get uh, concepts in there that is, for example, highlighted automatically, and you can drag them into your tool, like being the subject, the predicate, or the object of the nano publication. Mm -hmm. But um, not that I want to claim the term in any way, but there is a, a very strong definition in our in our papers on nano publication to say the subject, predicate, and object should refer to a known ontologically defined identifier for each of the three. Uh, so is your t the question is, is your tool connected to those ontologies so that if people type something, you say, okay, do you mean this term, and therefore you can refer to a certain UUID? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have a, a lookup function in the... I, I obviously don't have much time to really demonstrate the system, but um, when you... Um, there is a, an ontological search term element that you can just click a button, and it, it, it currently all it does is it runs on the NCBO um, repository, yeah. but we can extend that to... to and and then the output is RDF or not? Or uh, no, it's not other yet. Things, it sorry. will be, but it, that's, that's, yeah, I have to admit, the output of the system is not currently RDF. But, that but is, that's that quite is, easy to... to yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. And, and actually, as preparation for this, um, this uh, workshop, I have encoded uh, a methodology that actually does that. So it takes the data and dumps it into uh, an AL file quite straightforwardly. So it gets a nano publication seal of approval? Does it get a nano publication seal of approval then? Yes. Oh, great, great, great. Perfect. All right. Well, we've achieved something here. Thank you. Um,